Today is the 15th of uh, August and we come to uh, Majimanikaya Sutta 66, Latukiko Pama Sutta, the simile of the quail. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of the Anguttarapans at a town of theirs named Apana. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer rope, went into Apana for arms. When he had wandered for arms in Apana and had returned from his arms round, after his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. When it was morning, the Venerable Udayan dressed, and taking his bowl and outer rope, he too went into Apana for arms. When he had wandered for arms in Apana and had returned from his arms round, after his meal he went to the same grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then, while the Venerable Udayan was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Then when it was evening, the Venerable Udayan rose from meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. How many painful, sta how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Remember, sir, formerly we used to eat in the evening, in the morning, and during the day, outside the proper time. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon the daytime meal outside the proper time. Remember, sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, Faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day, outside the proper time, yet the Blessed One tells us to abandon it. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Out of love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that daytime meal outside the proper time. Then we ate only in the evening and in the morning. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that night meal, which is outside the proper time. Remember, sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, the Blessed One tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of our two meals. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Once, Remember, sir, a certain man had obtained some soup during the day, and he said, Put that aside, and we will all eat it together in the evening. Nearly all cooking is done at night, little by day. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandon that night meal, which was outside the proper time. Stop here for a moment. So this monk, uh, having uh, followed the Buddha's instructions for many years, uh, then one day he was thinking, uh, the Buddha has been very been a very good teacher and uh, because of the, the Buddha he has got rid of many painful states uh, and obtained many pleasant states, uh, got rid of many unwholesome states uh, and acquired many wholesome states. Uh. So he was thinking uh, that uh, last time the monks used to eat three meals a day then there was a time when the Buddha said uh, uh, stop the afternoon meal uh, uh, at first, he found it very difficult to to let go of this afternoon meal uh, because uh, the afternoon and night meals uh, are better than the morning. The morning, uh, usually lay people don't have enough time to cook. Uh, uh. And then later, the Buddha said, abandon the night meal also. Again, he was very upset, uh, but because he was a very uh, good disciple, uh, even though it was difficult to do, uh, he had faith in the Buddha. Uh, and out of love and respect for the Buddha, uh, he did what the Buddha instructed. It has happened, Venerable Sir, that monks wandering for arms in the thick darkness of the night 
have walked into a cesspool, cesspit, fallen into a sewer, walked into a thorn bush and fallen over a sleeping cow. They have met hoodlums who, who had already committed a crime and those planning one, and they have been sexually enticed by women. Once, Marimul Sir, I went for wandering for arms in the thick darkness of the night. A woman washing a pot saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed out in terror, Mercy me, a devil has come for me. I told her, Sister, I am no devil, I am a monk waiting for arms. And she said, Then it's a monk whose ma has died and whose pa has died. Better monk that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for arms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of the night. Rebel sir, when I recollected that, I thought, how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, when they used to walk for arms at night, uh, all of these things happened, uh, fell into a cesspit, uh, uh, and so uh, this uh, full of shit, uh, and uh, walked into a thorn bush, fell over a sleeping cow, and met hoodlums, uh, and sexual, sexually enticed by women at night. Uh, and then uh, this instance uh, when, you know, monks, when they beg for food, uh, they are not supposed to open their mouth, uh, not supposed to ask. Uh. So she's, he just stood beside this woman who was washing this pot. Na. Still standing there quietly, eh? the woman didn't know he was there na, until there was a flash of lightning. Suddenly saw him, eh? got so frightened. Na. After that, cursed him. <laughs> so he said, na, uh, so the Buddha has rid them of many painful states na, uh, and quite many pleasant states. Na. So these Buddha's instructions are uh, initially uh, is, uh, for... For a person not used to it, nah, you'll find it nah, very hard to practice, like eating one meal a day or eating two meals a day and not having your dinner. But when you get used to it, nah, then you realize it is sufficient. And then you realize nah, you are the better for it nah, because you are more healthy. Eating too much, nah, uh, you, you'll not be healthy. Nah. So to dine, there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this say, what? Such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting, and they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether, and a thick yoke. Suppose Udain, a quail were tethered by a rotting creeper, and would thereby expect injury, captivity, or death. Now suppose someone said, the rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity or death is for her a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, verbal sir. For that quail, the rotting creeper by which she is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity or death is a strong, stout, tough and rotting tether and a thick yoke. So too Udain. There are certain mis misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They say, what? Such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting, and they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So the Buddha is saying, nah, uh, sometimes the Buddha makes a precept uh, and certain monks uh, they, they think it's such a small thing why the, the Buddha uh, make this precept uh, don't allow them this and that uh. so they don't follow uh. and when they don't follow uh, this, uh, this becomes a, a, a problem for them uh. Uh, just like a, a strong uh, tough, uh, unrotting tether, thick yoke. Uh. And the Buddha gives a simile of a quail, uh, a, a, a kind of bird, uh, which is caught by this uh, rotting creeper. Uh, if, if, you, if a human were caught by this rotting creeper, uh, we can easily break it. Uh. But for this quail, uh, because it's so small, uh, 
uh, uh, that rotting creeper uh, is a strong, stout uh, bond uh, and she cannot escape from it. Uh, so she will either uh, be captured uh, or die there. Uh, uh. So in the same way the Buddha says, uh, when, a, when a monk uh, does not follow the instructions uh, of the Buddha, uh, that becomes a big problem for him. Uh. Udain, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, What? Such a mere trifle, such a little thing to be abandoned as this? The Blessed One tells us to abandon. The sublime One tells us to relinquish. Yet they abandon that and do not show this courtesy towards me or towards those monks, the desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer's. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Suppose Udain, a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle, were tethered by stout leather thongs, but by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst the thongs and then go where he likes. Now suppose someone said, the stout leather thongs by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered, are for him a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. Would he be speaking rightly? No, Venerable Sir. The stout leather thongs by which that royal tusker elephant is tethered, which by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst, and then go where he likes, are for him a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. So too, Dain, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this. Uh, and they abandon that and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mine as aloof as a wild deer's. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Uh, so, here the Bible gives the converse. Uh, Sometimes a monk is told to follow certain instructions. Uh, he may not like it, uh, but out of uh, love and respect for the Buddha, they comply. Uh, uh, so then uh, there is no, uh, uh, they have they have no problem. Uh, they, they, uh, this 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 precept doesn't make make any problem for them. Uh, uh, just like this uh, uh, king's elephant. Uh, it's so strong, uh, even it's bound by a tough leather, you can simply break it. Uh, so it all depends on our mind. If the mind is strong, uh, it can overcome anything. Uh, this attitude, uh, our attitude is very important. Uh, there's one sutta, if you all remember, uh, last year we did the Sangyutta Nikaya, and then the Buddha gave this uh, example that uh, Sakadeva Raja, uh, went to war with the Asuras, and then uh, Sakadeva Raja won, and then the Asura chieftain uh, was tied up, his hands and feet were tied, uh, and he was brought to the Deva city. Uh. And then the Buddha said, uh, if when he was brought to the, uh, in captivity uh, to the Deva city, uh, if his attitude was uh, that uh, that. Uh, Sakadeva Raja was wrong la, and they were right na, in the battle na, and um, he shouldn't be uh, caught na, in captivity and all that. Na. Then he'll be feeling uh, a lot of suffering. La. He cannot accept the fact that he's shackled up, na, tied up. Na. But on the other hand, na, if his attitude uh, was that na, they were wrong to start the battle, la, that uh, Sakadeva Raja and the Devas were correct. La. So uh, even though he's uh, tied up uh, and brought as a prisoner, uh, he doesn't mind it. Uh, so for him, uh, because of that attitude, uh, when he's uh, brought as a prisoner to the Deva city, uh, he, is not, he does not suffer mentally. Uh, he accepts it. Uh, so our attitude uh, in life uh, is very important. So like in this case, uh, like the Buddha says, uh, the Buddha says uh, makes a certain precept. Uh, there are certain monks uh, who think uh, it's such a small thing and they refuse to comply. Uh, for them, that becomes a big problem. Uh, uh, just like some people, uh, uh, certain things, uh, they think uh, precept. Uh, 
uh, it's not necessary to follow. Uh. Mm. And on the other hand, uh, there are some monk disciples of the Buddha, they also think that it's a small thing, uh, but because they have love and respect for the Buddha, and also they think the Buddha is wiser than them, uh, they comply. Uh. And then after that, uh, later uh, they realize uh, the Buddha uh, is actually wiser than them. That's why like earlier the example, uh, the when the Buddha stopped them from eating the afternoon meal and eating the night meal. Uh, at first, uh, they were not happy, but later in the long run, uh, then they realized uh, the Buddha made the, the, uh, gave the wise instruction. Suppose Udayan, there were a poor, penniless, destitute man, and he had one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind and some grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and one hag of a wife, not the best kind. He might see a monk in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. But being unable to abandon his one dilapidate, dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and his one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and his grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, he is unable to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said, the tethers by which a man, the tethers by which that man is tethered, so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel, etc., and his hag of a wife, not of the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a feeble, weak, rotten, tallest tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel, etc., and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a strong, stout, tough, and rotting feather and a thick yoke. So too, Dain, there are certain misguided men here, who, when told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me, as well as towards those monks, desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, the Buddha gives this uh, example uh, of this poor man. Uh. He's got this uh, dilapidated uh, house and uh, bed and uh, uh, pumpkin seeds uh, and, this, uh, and a hack of a wife. Uh. That's, uh, that's all he owns. Uh. And he sees the monk uh, so uh, happy, uh, having renounced everything, uh, having a good meal and can devote his time to meditation, no stress, etc., no worries, uh, no uh, uh, creditor chasing him, uh, uh, he's not in debt, etc. And so he envies that monk, but because he cannot let go, uh, even all this, uh, um, the poor state he's in, uh, he still cannot let go. Uh, so that becomes a, a strong uh, bond for him. Lah. Suppose Udain, there were a rich householder or a householder's son with great wealth and property, with a vast number of gold ingots, a vast number of granaries, a vast number of fields, a vast amount of land, a vast number of wives, and a vast number of men and women slaves. He might see a monk in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. And being able to abandon his vast number of gold ingots, his vast number of granaries, his vast number of fields, his vast amount of land, his vast number of wives, and his vast number of men and women slaves. 
he is able to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said, the tethers by which that householder or householder's son is tethered, so that he can abandon his vast number of gold ingots, etc., his vast number of men and women slaves, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, the tethers by which that householder or householder's son is tethered, so that he can abandon his vast number of gold ingots, his etc., his vast number of men and women slaves, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. So too, Dian, there are certain clansmen here, who, when told by me, abandon this, abandon that, and do not show discourtesy towards me, or towards those monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, and ruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mine as aloof as a wild deer's. For them that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha gives the converse example of a very rich man with a vast amount of property and wives and slaves, etc. But even then, with so much property and wives, he still can let go everything and renounce. Uh, so for him, uh, uh, all those things uh, are not a strong bond. So here he shows uh, it's just the state of the mind. Uh, if your mind is strong, uh, it doesn't matter how much property you have. Uh, if your mind is weak, uh, like the earlier example, uh, the poor, penniless, destitute man uh, in that dilapidated uh, house and uh, weaker bed and, and, and only... Property he has is green and pumpkin seeds in a pot uh, and a hang of a wife. Uh, still, he cannot let go. Uh. Udayan, there are four kinds of persons to be found existing in the world. What are the four? Here, Udayan, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him. He tolerates them. He does not abandon them, remove them, do away with them and annihilate them. Such a person I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him. He does not tolerate them. He abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Such a person, too, I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him now and then through lapses of mindfulness. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Just as if a man were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate heated for a whole day, the, the falling of the water drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too, here some person practices the way, etc. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Such a person, too, are called fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person, having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, divests himself of attachment and is liberated with the destruction of attachment. Such a person I call unfettered, not fettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is talking about four types of persons. When he is practicing the spiritual path, memories of the home life, all the attachments beset him. And then he tolerates them. If he tolerates them, he is not going to succeed in any way. Very soon he will go back to the lay life. The second person... Uh, these memories come and haunt him, uh, but he does not tolerate them. Uh, 
removes them, does away with them. The third one, now and then it comes to, um, uh, so the second one is better. The third one, uh, now and then uh, these uh, memories uh, from the home life come to disturb him. Uh, and, but he, uh, he gets rid of them. Uh, uh. So these three, uh, they, he's, the, he still has not uh, removed uh, attachment. Uh. Attachment still comes to disturb him. Uh. Only the last one, uh, uh, he has uh, he's liberated uh, uh, and destroyed attachment. Uh. There are Udain, five cords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, Udain, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. A filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, that it should be feared. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is talking about the five chords of sensual pleasure, namely worldly pleasure, the pleasure and joy we get because of beautiful forms, Sounds, smells, tastes, and touch. La. And the Buddha calls this uh, filthy pleasure, coarse pleasure, ignoble pleasure. And it should not be cultivated, la. should be feared, la, because it results in suffering. Uh, all these uh, uh, worldly pleasures we engage in, uh, uh, it gives us pleasure for a short time. Uh, and then uh, it's followed by craving. La. And attachment, and when we, because everything is impermanent, when we cannot get it, uh, then grief will arise, uh, grief and covetousness. Here, Udain, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away as well of delight, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, that it should not be feared. Let's stop here for a moment. So here... Uh, the Buddha makes a very clear distinction. These two types of pleasure, worldly pleasure, should not be uh, pursued, should not be cultivated, it should be feared because it results in suffering. But the, 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 the bliss and the, the joy and the happiness that comes from uh, the first jhana, the second jhana, third and fourth jhana, the Buddha calls it uh, the bliss of renunciation, uh, bliss of peace, uh, enlightenment. Uh, and this type of pleasure, the Buddha says, uh, should be pursued, uh, should be developed, should be cultivated, should not be feared. Uh. So nowadays, a lot of people, they don't understand. Uh, they say you can be attached to jhana, you should not be attached to jhana. But the Buddha is telling us, uh, go ahead and um, be attached to jhana, uh, enjoy jhana, because uh, uh, it has uh, four good um, Results lah. So tapana, sakadagamin, anagamin, and arahan hood lah. Stated in some sutta. Here Udain, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Now this, I say, belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The applied thought and sustained thought that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. Now this, I say, also belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The delight and pleasure that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the fading away as well of delight, 
a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. Now this I say also belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The equanimity and pleasure that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Now this I say belongs to the imperturbable. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha distinguishes uh, uh, these uh, four jhanas. Uh. The first three the Buddha calls perturbable, uh, shakeable. Uh. Why? Because uh, in the first jhana you still have thoughts. Uh, and these thoughts uh, are the, this is, uh, this is applied and sustained thought. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, the cause uh, for, for it being perturbable, uh, the first jhana. And the second one, uh, the second jhana, the piti and sukha, delight and pleasure, uh, is the cause from, for, for it to be said to be perturbable. Uh. The third jhana is the equanimity and pleasure uh, that causes it to be perturbable. But in the fourth jhana, uh, it is said to enter the fourth jhana, the monk has to abandon pleasure and pain, uh, grief and joy uh, before he can enter the fourth jhana. And the fourth jhana is said to be um, imperturbable, uh, unshakable, uh, it's a very deep state. Uh. Here Udayan, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. That, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, with the fading away as well of delight, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. That surmounts it, but that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. That surmounts it, but that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udayan, with the complete surmounting of percent of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. That surmounts it, but that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say, surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udayan, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, Aware that consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. I surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness. Aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. I surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surmounts it. Thus I speak of the abandoning even of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. You see, Udain, any factor, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak. No, Venerable Sir. That is what the Blessed One said. Remember, Udain was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. It's the end of the Sutta. So, here this last part, now you can see, you can see uh, that the Buddha encourages his monks, uh, to attain uh, up to the highest, uh, uh, the cessation of perception and feeling. Uh, when a monk can attain that state, uh, when he comes out of it, uh, he can become liberated. Uh. So the example given in this sutta about the poor destitute man uh, with a broken down house and a dilapidated bed and all that, uh, and a hang of a wife, uh, even in such a poor uh, situation, uh, yet uh, he cannot give up, cannot renounce. On the other hand, uh, the rich man uh, with so many wives and property and slaves, uh, 
he can give up everything uh, and renounce, become a monk. Uh, so it all depends on our state of mind. Uh, that's why uh, this uh, determination, aditana, determination is very important. If we do things uh, half-heartedly, uh, we will never succeed in anything. Uh, but if our mind is very strong, then anything uh, we can overcome. I remember reading somewhere, the Buddha said, uh, if a person, uh, if your determination is so strong, uh, uh, even the devas uh, cannot uh, hinder you. Uh. For example, when the Buddha was uh, striving for enlightenment, uh, Mara was uh, trying to obstruct him. Uh, and yet, uh, Mara was so powerful, uh, also could not obstruct the Buddha from attaining enlightenment because the Buddha's determination was too great. Uh.